What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about war in space? Probably lasers, explosions, and giant spaceships colliding in a scene straight out of a video game or a Star Wars movie. And while these interstellar battles might sometimes provide a fun escape from the real world, a conflict being fought high above the Earth is actually closer to reality than it is to science fiction. War in space might be inevitable, but it's not going to look like any battle we've seen before. As we speak, the world's greatest powers are drawing up their plans to weaponize low Earth orbit, and the nation that dares to make the first move will trigger a new space race with some potentially terrifying consequences. So, who's it going to be? In January 2025, one of the first executive orders made by Donald Trump called for a golden dome over America. This wouldn't be an actual dome, it wouldn't be gold either. Trump was calling for a space-based missile defense system to protect America from a new generation of hypersonic weapons technology that has already been developed by Russia and China. Hypersonic missiles are essentially weaponized spaceflight technology. Take everything that we've learned about rocket engines, orbital maneuvering, navigation, and re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, and then apply that to a missile. So instead of going to space with the goal of coming back down for a safe, soft landing, we are aiming to come back down and blow something up. Let's start on the Earth. In 2011, Israel began operation of their own national missile defense system, the Iron Dome. This one is designed for short-range rocket attacks, primarily coming from distances between 4 and 70 kilometers away. There are three layers to the dome. One is detection. Ground-based radar detects launches and tracks threats through the air. Two is battle management. A computer system prioritizes incoming rockets based on their threat to populated areas. Three is interception. Small missiles destroy incoming projectiles mid-flight. The Iron Dome has a 90% interception rate, but it is optimized for a low-volume attack by unguided missiles. Each ground station that makes up the dome can protect around 150 square kilometers, and the average cost to activate the Iron Dome is around $1 million per attack. Now, scaling that up to a system that would protect the continental United States is no small task. We are looking at a landmass that is around 8,600 times larger than Israel. We're also talking about threats that are significantly more advanced than small rockets. China and Russia have developed some terrifying new weapons over the past decade, and while those nations are not our adversaries today, they definitely aren't building missiles just for fun. This is our biggest threat, the hypersonic glide vehicle, HGV. This is the weapon of the future. It's an intercontinental ballistic missile, a spaceship, a fighter jet, and a bomb, all wrapped into one sleek package. Let's start with the basics. An intercontinental ballistic missile and a rocket booster that puts satellites into orbit are essentially the same thing, always have been. The first rocket boosters used by the Soviet Union and the Americans in the late 1950s were just repurposed ICBMs. The difference is in that word, ballistic. So when a traditional rocket booster like the SpaceX Falcon 9 flies a payload to space, it will burn up most of its fuel and then shut down and separate from an upper stage vehicle just above Earth's atmosphere. This second stage will then ignite its own engine and navigate higher into space to achieve orbit to deploy the payload. With a ballistic missile, the booster will shut down and separate above the atmosphere, and the payload will be released on a ballistic trajectory, meaning it's basically flying like a cannonball. It has no propulsion or guidance system of its own, so the payload, which in this case would be a bomb, is going to keep flying under its own momentum until it reaches the top of an arc and starts to fall back down. This kind of intercontinental attack has become relatively easy to defend against, because once the bomb separates from its booster, it becomes very simple using radar to predict the rest of the flight path. So if you launch a high-speed interceptor from the ground, you can hit the bomb on its way down and neutralize the threat. In this case, we are using kinetic interceptors, which means that we are not shooting the bomb with another missile that's going to blow up on impact. At that speed, all you need to do is hit the bomb with something solid, and physics will take care of the rest. That was the general plan for defending America from nuclear threats across the oceans for many decades. 
The US has ground-based interceptor stations in the regions of Alaska, California, and New England. Washington DC is the only city in America that has its own ground-based air defense system. But this is the 21st century, and we have the technology to create weapons that are infinitely smarter and more maneuverable than ballistic missiles. Enter the hypersonic glide vehicle. So again, we need a rocket booster that can quickly send a payload above the Earth's atmosphere. It's what happens after stage separation that makes these different. So instead of releasing a nuclear cannonball, the glide vehicle kicks on its own rocket engine and begins to navigate through space. At this point, the glide vehicle can continue on at its current altitude. It can go higher, it can go lower, but at some point it will begin to descend back down to Earth. This is where the weapon becomes truly dangerous. If you've ever seen a SpaceX Starship return to Earth, then you know how this goes. The Starship upper stage is essentially just a really gigantic hypersonic glide vehicle. It goes halfway around the world on a suborbital trajectory and then re-enters the atmosphere to target a location on the surface. When the Starship hits the atmosphere, it's traveling at over 25,000 kilometers per hour. That's hypersonic speed, which is anything over five times the speed of sound, which is 1200 kilometers per hour. So this is about Mach 20 that we are hitting in the re-entry phase. A hypersonic weapon will be traveling just as fast. You'll also notice that as the starship descends through the atmosphere, it's surrounded by this red glow. That is plasma. It happens when you compress a gas so violently that the molecules get super excited and crash into each other and start releasing free ions. So this plasma is like a super hot cloud of electrified chaos. It's the same stuff that the sun is made of, and because plasma is electric, it actually can absorb radar and radio waves, meaning that there is no way to track an object that is going through re-entry using traditional radar. When a vehicle like the space shuttle or a crew capsule returns to Earth, there is a communications blackout period during re-entry when ground control loses all connection to the vehicle. SpaceX has been able to get around this by using Starlink, so instead of communications going down to the Earth, it goes up to a satellite first. But in the context of these hypersonic weapons, once it hits the atmosphere, the plasma buildup will make the weapon invisible to ground-based radar. Oh, and it's also moving so fast that even if we could track it, we couldn't hit it with a kinetic interceptor. Now, going back to the Starship example, as it comes through the atmosphere, it slows down a lot. By the time the plasma cloud dissipates, we're moving at a speed below 10,000 kilometers per hour, which is still hypersonic, but it's much slower than before. And that is by design. Starship is built to create drag and slow itself down in the atmosphere because its goal is to land safely in one piece. If we compare that to the HGV, it's a small vehicle that weighs in between one and two metric tons. It's shaped like an arrowhead with a perfectly smooth curved surface all around. This is designed to create the smallest amount of drag possible, so it's carrying way more velocity coming out of the re-entry phase than a starship. Now this is the glide phase. The HGV is flying through the atmosphere and it's using aerodynamic control to maneuver itself just like a supersonic jet airplane, which means that now, even though we finally have the ability to track this thing and shoot at it with the ground-based interceptors, it can change directions, it can evade the defense network. And worst of all, we still don't even know exactly where it's going, which makes it even more difficult to defend against. Pretty scary stuff, right? And this weapons technology exists right now, at least that's what the Russians and Chinese are claiming. They've never tested a weapon like this, but given that both nations have established track records with successful spaceflight programs, there's no reason to say that they couldn't build a weapon like this. Of course, the United States has their own arsenal of advanced hypersonic weapons, but offense is pointless without a strong defense, and that's where we get back to Donald Trump's Golden Dome. The best hope that we have of defending against these intercontinental hypersonic weapons is to track them and intercept before they have a chance to re-enter the atmosphere. They are most vulnerable during the boost phase because a rocket booster is not particularly maneuverable. It has to fly in a relatively straight arc, so we can track that and we can hit it. But we definitely can't intercept a rocket launched from China with a missile launched from America. It's just too far away. 
And that's why we go to space, a space-based network of trackers and interceptors in low Earth orbit will see a booster coming from above. That makes it easy to follow and launch a kinetic projectile that would impact the booster and break it apart. Even if the glide vehicle was able to separate, it could still be tracked through space by a tight network of satellites. And worst case scenario, the glide vehicle hits the atmosphere and begins re-entry, a satellite tracker could use infrared to follow the heat signature of the vehicle all the way down. The radar blackout wouldn't matter anymore. Infrared tracking from the ground is more difficult because there's so much interference from the modern world. That's why we parked the James Webb telescope a million kilometers away from the Earth so that it could do infrared imaging without interference. You could maybe have a usable infrared tracking station in the Alaskan tundra, where it's far away from any external sources of radiation. So we can also use these space-based tracking systems to enhance ground-based interceptors. If the threat ends up getting closer to the ground than it is to orbit, then we can still try and intercept it with a ground-based weapon that is using tracking data from a satellite network. Radar is a line of sight technology, so if a GLAD vehicle is able to get down to a low altitude at a far enough distance, then it can become invisible to radar until it gets too close to do anything about it. Okay, so the Golden Dome is actually starting to sound like a pretty good idea. Every American would probably sleep more soundly at night knowing that a system like this was in place above their heads. But what would that look like? Using satellites to defend a landmass like the United States is tricky. You could place satellites into a geosynchronous orbit over the USA that would always remain directly above the country at all times, but in order to achieve geosynchronous orbit, your satellites need to be at an altitude of around 35,000 kilometers, and that is way too far away to be of any use intercepting a missile. So instead, you need to use low Earth orbit satellites. These would complete one trip around the Earth every 90 minutes, so you would require a network of around 1,900 satellites for continuous coverage of the entire planet all at once. Which is a lot, but it's not an unfathomable amount. SpaceX currently has over 7,000 Starlink satellites in orbit as we speak. Starlinks are a lot more simple than weaponized platforms in space, but when you account for the scale of the network, it probably comes pretty close to evening out. And the space launch capabilities in the United States are definitely moving in the direction of making it easier and cheaper to put large amounts of large objects into orbit. The SpaceX Starship and the Blue Origin New Glenn are at the forefront of that movement, heavy lift reusable rocket technology that has yet to be proven but is showing a lot of promise. We also have existing rocket infrastructure like the SpaceX Falcon Heavy and the ULA Vulcan Centaur that could still get the job done if necessary. Even with the benefit of reusable rocket technology, this won't be cheap. Each of the 2,000 defense satellites are estimated to cost around $9 million to build. Then, when factoring in the cost of deploying them all into orbit, that estimate climbs to somewhere between $15 and $25 billion to deploy the entire network, which is a lot of money, but in the context of the US defense spending, it's not actually that much. And there's going to be a sustained cost of maintaining the satellites. That's going to be somewhere between 3 and $5 billion per year, assuming that each satellite has an average 5-year lifespan. When you deploy satellites at a relatively low Earth orbit, they will encounter a small amount of atmospheric drag, and that's going to slowly pull them down over time. So they either need to be reboosted to keep them up or retired once they fall too low. SpaceX Starlink satellites are designed to retire themselves after five years of operation by falling into the atmosphere where they get vaporized into dust. Of course, the true cost to a Golden Dome will be the escalation of a military space race. If America does it, then China and Russia will do it too. And this changes the dynamic of a global conflict. If everyone is protected by a space-based network, that means a first strike has to happen in space to knock out that defense system before a ground strike would even be possible. So, this is very quickly going to escalate from a space-based platform that defends against ground-based weapons to an inter-orbit conflict where satellites are directly attacking each other in a race to cripple the enemy's defense. The result of that, if we don't all end up dead on the ground, would be a lot of broken stuff in space. And in a future vision of low Earth orbit that's packed solid with weapons platforms and communication satellites, the debris from a space battle will hit other objects in space, 
then they'll break apart and create more debris that will hit other objects, and on and on until the Earth is encased in a shell of twisted metal. So anyone left alive would never be able to go to space again. Anyway, we're still very early in this whole Golden Dome idea. So far, Trump's order has identified three phases of development. Phase 1 will happen in 2025 and 2026. That has the US Space Force establishing a Golden Dome Task Force. They are going to develop and deploy the first prototype sensor and interceptor satellites. Phase 2 is between 2027 and 2030. This is where the Golden Dome reaches its first operational capability, with the goal of having over 500 fully operational interceptors in orbit. Phase 3, from 2030 on, would be the establishment of global coverage and full operation of the Golden Dome. So there's little doubt remaining that it will be the United States who make the first move in a dangerous new space race. Now it's up to the other main contenders to see how they respond. The consequences to the loser this time could be devastating. <laughs>